Hi, this is Pat Moorhead, and welcome back to day two of the 6.5 Summit. We are here talking quantum, doing the track opener. We are super excited about this technology, and I am just amazed at how the wheel of innovation turns. And one thing I love about quantum is it's definitely the next big thing. Yeah, Pat, it is something that the entire world is kind of watching very closely to say, what's gonna happen next? What will quantum do? How is it gonna change the world? And I think more and more each year that's passed, we're starting to get more of that concrete idea of ways that through entanglement, through being you know, in partnership with classical computing, yeah, that's right. that quantum is going to actually make a very big difference. And I say actually because I think there's been skeptics over time but companies like IBM have really been breaking through, and I'm excited about this particular session. Yeah, with that said, let's introduce our guest, Dario Gill, how are you? I'm wonderful. Great it's to great see to you, here. welcome back to the 6.5. It's always good to be here. Yeah. yeah, Dario, it's great to have you. You know, you heard me in the windup. There has been a lot of enthusiasm and excitement, and there's been some skepticism, of course, because something like quantum is so uh, difficult, so challenging. That's right. Yeah, creates such a big opportunity. Talk a little bit about the state of quantum. Where are we at right now with, with, with quantum computing overall in the market? Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's, I always like to say that the level of difficulty is a 10 out of 10, and I think that that sort of like <laughs> has, has historically hindered the progress. But, but frankly speaking, I think uh, from a technology maturity, obviously it's never been more sophisticated, and I'll, and I'll highlight a few points. So first, real systems, have been now running for quite a while. So we put our first system in the cloud, it was May 2016. So you fast forward to today, we have over 20 quantum computers on the right. IBM cloud. They run 24 seven around the clock. A community has been built with close to half a million people around the world. We have cumulatively run over two trillion circuits, meaning think about it as the programs in a quantum computer, running on actual quantum hardware. There's over 2,000 scientific publications that have already been generating using IBM quantum hardware. We have six quantum computation centers now all over the world. And, um, and what, so what you're seeing around that is that first, quantum is already part of the R&D environment of nations and regions. Right. So, you know, I would say maybe 10 years ago, maybe it wasn't even in the top 10. Now it's in the top five category. So, so the first market that has been created is actually the one of serving the R&D community, where universities, national laboratories, economic development engines within regions are saying, I want to invest in the future, yeah. I want to create this environment. So I'm actually seeing the beginning of the curve of going up because people are now calling us to say, hey, I saw what you did in the Basque country, I saw what you did in Korea, I saw what you did in Japan, I want to do this here. And the same thing with companies too. I took a tour I was told I was one of the, the, the few people to take a tour of the facility where I saw at least 15 of your operational quantum computers. The first quantum data center in Poughkeepsie. It, exactly, yeah. and that was a real, that was an amazing thing. I mean, it's one thing I've, I've crawled through multiple data centers before, <laughs> but this one was just so unique. And one thing I really appreciated too, the security guard that, that, that was within 15 <laughs> feet of the entire group, yeah. uh, the entire Trust time. Trust that verify, right? No, I mean, listen, <laughs> you're, you're working on some really uh, important stuff. And, you know, if, as I've said before, what amazes me, and I've been, you know, doing this longer, I used over 30 years, and I've never seen a research roadmap. And uh, what's even more unique is you're actually hitting those goals and you're making multiple announcements. It's not, you know, make an announcement and we'll come back to you in 18 months and, and tell you where. By the way, I'm seeing a lot of that uh, right now. But can you talk about your most recent announcements and how that relates uh, to what we're likely to see in the future? Yeah, so I'm glad you mentioned the, the our quantum development roadmap and yeah. it's related to the question you were asking me before about when this uncertainty and people say, where is the state, what is happening? We thought right. one of the best things that we could do for the entire community and the industry was to provide clarity as to what was going to unfold and yes. what could you expect. Yes. But it is, it is a moment of vulnerability too when you say, hey, 
three years ago, I'm gonna go from 65 to 127 qubits to 433 to over 1,000. This is what's gonna happen with the software stack about how we're gonna evolve Qiskit, right? right. Which is the development environment, how we're gonna abstract things. And, and yeah, you go public, you say, I'm gonna do it, and then you gotta do it, but you are, you are pacing the frontier of the field. And, you know, I'll make a point, when we broke the 100 qubit barrier, which, by the way, is something that, you know, even a few years later, no one else has done, right? right? So we've moved even from 127 to 433. Why were we so proud of it? Because it is the first time that we were able to bring a lot of semiconductor packaging technology, but now adapted to the world of superconductivity and low temperature, where now you could break the plane and you could have your cubics, your IO layer, your interconnects right. at multiple different layers. That was a real tour de force in being able to bring an adjacency expertise that we mm -hmm. had and being able to develop. So what have we announced that is exciting around, around all of this? I would say one of the things I'm incredibly excited is how we're shifting again to the idea of modularity. So in some ways, the chip that we will build this year with over a thousand qubits will be the limit of how big a chip we will make for how many qubits can fit in there. Let's say order of you know, a thousand or so, right? So then you say, well, how are you gonna scale? How, what's gonna happen after right. that? So we introduced, we've been designing and we introduced relatively recently, IBM Quantum System 2. So the Quantum System 1 is that iconic box right. that everybody has seen with the, with the chandelier around that. And Quantum I have System, many pictures with that, by the way. Yeah, it's one it's of the most photographed to. machines yeah. in the world. <laughs> <laughs> I love that machine. Uh, but Quantum System 2, uh, what it speaks about is much larger chamber, so first of all, like the system which we will have it and you come to see it in November, yes. is, is massive. So inside the cryostat now, you can have multiple processors. So, so now the future is gonna be multi, just like in classical computing, you have multiple processors connected right. to one another and actually multiple systems connected to one another. So this idea of modularity at all levels is what is going to give lead to the idea of quantum-centric supercomputing, right. which is a hybrid classical quantum system designed for scale. And that's what's going to have tens of thousands of qubits working in concert with classical. The other mega idea that we could not be more excited, and, uh, you know, and given where we are, uh, you know, everybody will hear in a few weeks, yeah. Uh, is the, the, the path to actually implement a technique called error mitigation and error suppression. Everybody knows that part of the challenge of quantum computers are errors. How do you deal with them? Right. So ultimately, there's full error correction, right? There's a way to mitigate the errors permanently. But we have come up with a methodology to characterize the error, the noise present in the machine, and suppress it. So we made an announcement on something called the 100 by 100 challenge. And the 100 by 100 challenge is basically says, world, we will deliver by 2024 a capability where you can have 100 qubits with depth 100 right. that have been error corrected, error mitigated, error suppressed, right? Basically, we will approach the technique such that that depth, you can actually compute and get the good errors. And that is without a doubt in the space of the world of utility already. Right. So now we have a community approach with working groups in finance, in healthcare, in high energy physics, in materials, where some of the best people around the world are saying, okay, we're gonna take it as a challenge, we're gonna work together and design the algorithms and the experiments to exploit that capability. So that I'm thrilled about. 100 by 100. 100 by 100 challenge. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> Keeping these machines the fidelity high so that they can you know, go through these processes and, and do you know, really meet the promise of what we hear. Because that seems to be where, exactly. where the error correction seems to be the, the item that has come up as long as we've been going through, whether it's been superconducting, ion trapping, it's keeping the fidelity of these qubits high. So these very cool applications that we know are going to work in this entanglement uh, environment, Dario. And I'm really interested to see how these working groups start to come out. You know, we've seen some of those papers published over the last two years, uh, large financial institutions. And, and speaking of this, you have, you know, a number of these systems now deployed yep. around the world. You have built a, you know, you said half a million, but you have a large me uh, group of, of members in your networking group that are building on There's IBM. There's over 200 institutions too yeah. that are part of it. So number of institutions. Talk a little bit about how they're using 
these quantum machines? How are they using them? How are they testing them? What are they building towards right now? Where's this all going with this network that you've built? Yeah, so I'll give you a couple of examples. So when I, I, I made the point that it is also being used as a as an engine of R&D and economic development. So I'll give you that class. So when, when a nation uh, partners with IBM to create a quantum computation center, and we've announced already six, right? So we've done with, you know, in Canada, uh, in, in the US with partnership with the Cleveland Clinic, in Germany, which is the first one we did outside of the United States, in, uh, in the Basque country, in Spain, in South Korea, in Japan, and more to come. There are four quadrants that make that model. And they are a unique infrastructure, obviously putting the quantum computer and the infrastructure around it, an R&D agenda, you know, how we're gonna advance it, a skills and a development agenda, how are we gonna change curriculum, right. educate people, create certifications, training, etc., and then an industrial partnership model. So how will the local industry benefit from this capability? We have learned and we've been very successful in sort of, you know, incorporating that learning into our program to say, just giving you a computer is not enough. Yeah. Is we have to create all of those. So we always do all of those elements. So our partnership with IBM involves that. And then what happens is all of those elements come in. You start seeing faculty engaging with us to develop the curriculum. You then see a local consortium of companies who join, including very senior people in the company, CEOs that guide the strategic direction of how this new capability will impact the industry and the region. So all of those elements are there. Now, when we partner directly with that company, you know, let's say we're working with Wells Fargo, as an example. Um, so in there, what has happened is like firms are creating their first teams. So they, over the last few years, they've hired like their leader in quantum. And it's, it's fascinating to me to see it. You say, wow, you know, how could they have? If you if you look under the rocks, they'll find physicists in every institution, right? Sure. And people are like, you know, I did a PhD like in physics around that. I'm really interested in doing this. So, so they become a kernel, they form a small working group, and they start developing use cases with us. We have an offering called uh, the, the Quantum Accelerator, which is all use case oriented. So everybody will segment the use case that they care about. Yep. And with that local team and with us, they start developing what algorithms are, are useful. How would we start proving it? So that's one element. And then the second offering that we give them in addition to the quantum accelerator is obviously the access. And you could say you can have remote access, you can have dedicated access, you know, on the cloud. And for some of them, you know, as they get more advanced, you can have, do you want a full dedicated system around that? So those is the mechanism to engage. But I mean, the number of cases are, are just like hugely, hugely varied. Right. I would say in two core categories. One is where are we seeing traction? I would say first in the industrial sector. Why? Because they rely on the physical world. Sure. So if you are building materials, life sciences we're seeing picking up like crazy too around that. So all that kind of like physical world yeah. companies uh, care about it. And then the other category, because it involves around finding structure and data, has been the financial services industry. Yeah. So industrial sector, including life sciences, and then uh, uh, financial sector. So when sector. I said materials and anti-money laundering, I was you were you were already in there. You were close. <laughs> you were close. Exactly. So that approach seems to be very provocative and valuable for from my point of view for a couple of reasons. So first of all, each country gets to create their own value. And I know there's a lot of discussion of the centralization of technology uh, right now across just a, a few countries. So you're spreading the wealth per se to people who want to sign them. The second thing that, that strikes me is it's an ecosystem play. Yes. You're not just showing up and dropping off a bag of parts, okay? And then once you've uh, brought in the horizontal piece, you're, you're going vertical, right? Which in the end, everybody is vertical, right? Nobody is a, a horizontal. So it's I, I see those as three really good pieces. And you know, the last time I checked, in, in the last two or three major ecosystem plays or big tech plays, whether it's mobile, whether it's AI or ML, it takes an ecosystem. So I really like that approach. We talked a little bit about um, your roadmap, yes. and by the way, hitting the dates, um, you know, ex product person. So I'm very impressed with Thank hitting you. a date. The team has done a great job well, with that. Hitting a dates on something that science and you just don't know sometimes what you're going to come uh, right. across. Uh, at Think, you you released a new roadmap called the Quantum 
safe roadmap. Can you talk a little bit about what you announced and quite frankly, why do people need to be worrying or signing up for quantum safe security today if the supposed bad guys might not have this capability uh, five years from by the way, le leading quite, I think I know the answer, but I want to hear how you explain this. Yeah, this is the, the complementary piece of the implications to uh, quantum computing. And indeed, it has to do with the fact that, you know, famously, uh, you know, and we first learned about this community with Peter Short in the 1990s, is that one of the implications of large scale quantum computers are corrected yeah. will be to break, you know, asymmetric encryption. So, you know, the way, as everybody knows, like the way encryption works is we have two private keys that are made of two prime numbers, like right. your key and my key. The product of it is the public key. The public key is in the open, everybody has it, but if you just have that number and you sell me, tell me the two prime numbers that made that large key, it turns out to be exponentially costly for a classical computer. Yes. That asymmetry, how easy it is to multiply two numbers and how hard it is to find that product, is what we exploit in encryption. Now, what Peter Shore showed is that you could actually factor that public key and find the two prime numbers exponentially faster. Right. So now what, what does that mean? It means we need to change the encryption keys. It's not the fault of quantum computers. It's just to say, OK, well, that's an implication of it. The good news is that there's an answer. There are new algorithms of which you know, IBM Research has been a huge participant uh, in creating them. The NIST is in the final process of standardization. There's like four of them, and we've been involved in creating three of the four of them. And, and so now is the not small task of taking all the encryption that we have deployed all over the world, yeah. finding it, and replacing it with the new protocols. So that is the mission of IBM Quantum Safe, which is a uh, software and technology portfolio and the skills associated with making it happen to engage with right. government agencies, with clients and partners all over the world to do a few things. So first, uh, 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 a very important one. Do you even know where your encryption is and how it's being used? So in software, there's a notion of a software bill of materials. Okay, so one of the things that our uh, technology is creating of IBM Quantum Safe is uh, you know, cryptographic bill of materials. Mm -hmm. Scanning, understanding where cryptography is used, do you know what it is? And then that's step one. Once you actually know what your status is, then how do we remediate it? And how can we use as much automation as, pro as possible in software to go and replace it with the right um, uh, algorithm? Yeah. And also is the idea of crypto agility. Like in software, there's no notion of saying, well, you know, I deploy the software, we're done. And you're like, no, it's never done, right? <laughs> There's an idea of software <clears throat> agility and how you do that. So crypto agility is the same thing. It may be that we find something, we need to change something right. again. So how do you instill that idea? So those are core concepts of what we have announced and, and being able to now say we have software and technology to make it happen. And then we also have complementary skills to help you right. execute that. Love it. So Dario, Leading research for IBM, you know, you have some big tasks in front of you. You know, it's not just quantum, you lead AI, and we've hit this interesting inflection in, around AI where everybody's talking a lot about, you know, policy, regulation, how fast do we move? Well, in quantum, there's a similar question to be asked. And while we don't exactly know that commercialization breakthrough of where it's gonna, you know, the, the tipping point of scale. You know, one of the problems with AI is we had a lot of time and we had a lot of horizon to see this coming and we didn't really come to a lot of policies and companies like IBM had to come up with responsible frameworks right. because there there is no global uh, consensus on policy. There's no regulation. Uh, there's just some ideas out there. Yeah. So I'd love to get your a lens of how you're thinking about this for quantum because the implications of quantum could be tremendous from a security standpoint. That's right. From, from in many aspects and so how are you collaborating with government and thinking about this now and maybe trying to get ahead of it with quantum in a way that maybe we weren't able to do so with AI? And, and, and is that something that you think needs to be done? Yeah, I, it's a great question. And yes, and that is exactly how, how we operate. So, so I'll, I'll mention a couple of, of different vectors. So first, um, one is the broad implications. We just spoke about quantum safe. You have an implication for society of saying, if you know, this is a consequence of it. Yeah. How do we do everything possible to make sure that we're responsible actors and we mitigate the problem 
again, it's not Quantum's fault. It's the fault we picked an algorithm, you know, yeah. uh, in the past that needs to be changed. But be that as it may, we got to address the problem. So that's a one element. But then you you rightly pointed out that the technology itself, in, you know, itself is among the most you know protected technologies that. Um, that you know, both in a company like IBM, but also governments see it as a as a source of national uh, security and economic advantage as well. So we are actively engaged. One of the things we have is active dialogues with governments uh, on this topic, and I don't think it is a coincidence if you look at the list of, for example, partners and countries where we have deployed quantum computation centers of who they are. Um, it is it is a thoughtful process. It's not anything goes. The technology right. always stays in IBM. Controls all of those systems are IBM technology. Only IBM serves them, right, and uh, control them. So we're very very thoughtful about that aspect and requires appropriate engagement. Because while the systems right now are not capable of you know breaking encryption and doing things like that, in the future. Uh, they will, yeah. and 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 obviously, as you all very well know, like there's going to be a continuum, right, of capability. Yeah. That capability is already beginning to be present on on you know in terms of the technology that is being created. So you have to be engaged. You have to be responsible by your actions, and there's a lot of self-regulation, self-constraint that is also present um, to make sure that we get it to a good outcome. So so we do take that very 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 responsibly and very seriously. So just to tie all this together, I and mean, we've talked about roadmaps, we've talked about uh, basically quantum security roadmaps, how uh, you work with governments, H how do we, how should we look at the progress of bringing useful quantum computing, solving real problems, and at the same time, keeping that data safe? Yeah, so I would say from a technology perspective, three vectors one has to look at, and they have to come together. Quantity, quality, and speed as a way to understand the progress of the system. Quantity, obviously, you need more and more qubits over time. Quality, how well they obey quantum mechanics, you know, what's the quantum volume, the coherence and fidelity of the devices. And then the speed, how fast can you execute right. the circuits? It is the blend of those three that allows you to build a system that is more capable from the previous generation. So that's one element. The second element of it is how well is the software stack you know, operating such that you can do deal with errors. I think I think it's going to be a continuum. I think the people who think about it, there is nothing, and then there is a fault tolerant million qubit quantum computer right. are going to be wrong on how the technology evolves. What we are seeing is every year we release a more capable system. Right. The errors are better. The system is larger. It's faster. Quality is better, and you keep going like that. That's the history of computing. So as you go in there, we're going to cross a threshold that I'm pretty sure is going to happen in the window of the next you know, year or two, you are no longer talking a decade, where we're going to start entering this era of utility, where the combination of error mitigation, error suppression, higher quality devices, large enough, right, with good speed, are going to start doing demonstrations that when you compare to what you could do classically, you're starting to see, actually, that is starting to be better for these classes of problems. Right. That is going to be an important inflection point. I would say the last six, seven years were all about, hey, a new capability, learn about it, expose to people around it, you know, grow around it. But now the goal is, that's why the 100 by 100 challenge is so important. The way I think about it is, that's a challenge to the entire community. It's not IBM solving it by itself. We all work together across different sectors, and then we put dots on the map. And we say, hey, I think I did it. I think I did it. I think I crossed utility. There'll be a distribution. Four years later, we'll look back at the distribution and says, eh, 80% of those points were not true. You could do it better classically in the right. end. But there will be some yes. that will stand the test of time. And then when we look back, we will say, that's when that began, the next phase of inflection. That's the challenge, right? One to two years. Yeah. yeah awesome. And, and it absolutely, you never expect it until it's there. Right. You know, we keep, I keep referencing the AI trend, but it was like it wasn't there, it wasn't there, and all of a sudden it was there. there, and that was everything. That's right. And, you know, <laughs> That's I right. think we're going to have a similar curve, and the question mark, is it a year, is it two, is it three? But I think the fact is, is we're moving very, very quickly. Dario, thank you so much for joining us here at the 6.5 Summit. Thank you. It is great to be with you and to be at the Summit. Yeah.
All right, everybody, stay with us. We got more here from day two at the 6.5 Summit. You just heard from Dario Gill, IBM, head of research and senior vice president. More to come. See you all soon.